Next up, I am uh, super thrilled to be able to introduce you to Eric Alba. If you don't know him already, Eric of 24 Lives Per Second, stage is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you. All right, try not to pass out, Alba. It's going to be fine. Uh, oh, man. And, and is a clear lectern, so it's like I can't even shield my emotions like properly. Uh, hey, how's everybody doing? Um, Hello, uh, my name is Eric Alba. Uh, I develop, design, and produce immersive experiences for brands and cultural groups. So what does a creative producer do? Like my mom asks me all the time, my aunts at Thanksgiving. The short answer to my friends and family is, <laughs> I'm a bulldozer parent. I clear the road for my teams and partners to do their best work. Uh, I want to thank uh, the framework team, Laura, for inviting me to speak, and thanks to XR Studio for being such great hosts. And to all the attendees here and online, thank you for spending time with us today. So just quickly as a show of hands, who are students or recent graduates? They're probably all online, right? Okay. And how many are seasoned or in leadership roles, manager roles? Yes. Great. So yeah, Laura <laughs> was yelling at me to give her a title for my talk, and I was thinking about it, and it, it, it's always like this during delivery. You're just kind of like, doing the thing, and I thought it would be funny, and I texted her the file name. You know, art is never completed, only abandoned. And so, of course, this is actually the new title. Uh, you know, when they pull it from your cold, dead hands, you have to make sure they all know which one is the right one to use. Uh, so some caveats, really quickly. I'm not a graphic designer, um, and I might accidentally use profanity. Also, this talk is not about um, UI or user, user experience or UX. It's not about any of the R's, although it's good. It's not about data fizz or data viz, although that's part of what I do too. It's not about AI, although AI is exciting and weird. Oh man. No, not today. And this, this is, Jason Zada, my friend, directed that, so I always make it a, he knows I'm making fun of him. Uh, so you might be thinking, I don't know, maybe talk to Laura and her team. <laughs> so Laura asked me to do a talk, I asked what kind of talk. And she said, just tell her your story, man. It's good. And I'm like, all right, because uh, she thinks there might be some insp uh, inspiring takeaways. So here we go. So I'm going to take you on a journey of really bad decisions, hustling, imposter syndrome, uh, all kinds of fears that I went through and kind of like just really about like my emotions and crazy ass thinking about how I got to where I am today and a lot of random good luck, which is really not good luck because it's just really my friends in the right place at the right time helping someone out throughout my life. So I'm going to talk about some milestones in that journey. I hope you enjoy. Okay, so who am I? Well, depending on the day, I'm a creative director, I'm an experience designer, I'm a visual effects supervisor, I'm an executive producer, I'm a consultant, and I'm, and I'm also a mentor. And I've been mentoring for several years at New Inc. for four years, and I mentor at other, whenever, when I was at MSG, uh, I was a mentor, usually I offer that up because I really like to connect and help people because I'm an old man and why not pass on some you know, wisdom. Uh, some work I've been involved with, from 2019 through the end of 21, I was the vice president and executive producer of MSG Sphere Studios. My role was to determine the people and the tools, to find frameworks and processes and tactics um, needed to build a studio group that would inevitably concept, design, and build MSG Sphere's immersive experiences both inside and out, um, as well as inform and advise on the technology, infrastructure, and various areas inside the sphere. And there's a lot of information about this now since 4th of July when sort of they had a coming out party, so to speak, for the exosphere, the external LED screen. Um, in 2012, I produced a 10-day event experience in Oregon at the US Track and Field time trials, as well as the 40th anniversary of Nike, and this event slash installation was called Nike Camp Victory. Um, it was adjacent to the track and field, and it was meant to bring a bunch of people in and, you know, because it is a rather big gathering anyways, but also give them really interesting digital experiences, interaction and fun. Everything is, you know, highly gamified 
and social. So it had treadmill digital races with a leaderboard. You could run and see how fast you can run at what speed in 30 seconds. It was very, again, gamified and lots of, lots of leaderboard competition going on daily. Uh, people would keep coming back and trying and topping their speeds and you know, their distances. Um, it also had interactive touch maps visualizing a Nike. Back then, Nike had a band for running. It also had GPS on it, so you could basically see your runs. Um, and we made a nice little touch screen. And um, what's interesting about this is it's highly social as well as the treadmill game is, you know. It also had a 100 plus feet LED wall that was basically visualizing the trials, the time, the, the laps, the, the distances of the, uh, or not the distances, the actual uh, speed at which these runners were running at scale. So you would see someone move across very quickly so you can actually see how fast they're running when they're, when they're at their peak. And somewhere in the middle of that, I did a thing for the Museum of the Future in Dubai at the World Government Summit. Um, it was called Climate Change Reimagined. It's an exhibition. Every year they pick an exhibition and our topic and they host it for five days at the summit. So, uh, you know, world leaders and titans of industry and thought leadership would all kind of visit and kind of like ponder this topic that is part of the WGS. So it was a five room installation, featured a lot of interesting digital, uh, interactive and sort of like educational kind of material. The Museum of the Future premise is that it's a, it's a museum in the future, 50 years in the future, and this is how we solve climate change. And that's the story. So you're seeing sort of like aspirational uh, kind of imagery here, future farming, this idea. We actually had to make foods. I had to hire a chef to make cubed food made of crickets and the, food, the future foods. You know. And before all that, I was a visual effects supervisor. And I still am a visual effects. I just did a visual effects job not too long ago. And um, for, feature, you know, for uh, commercials, for television shows like Boardwalk Empire, The Sopranos, Veep, um, et cetera. But that's what I do. But who am I? So I'm a Filipino. I'm a first generation American. I'm an only child. Um, my sister, my half sister, is 18 years younger than me, so we never lived together. Uh, parents are divorced, which made me an army brat between New Jersey and Southern California. Um, I'm a high school graduate, I never went to college, and I'm a Capricorn. So I may have lost some of you already in this talk, just like my Tinder dates. Um, so Army brat, high school, in six years I went to four schools, and I ping pong each coast. So I, I, you know, one year I'm a surfer, the other I'm like wearing parkas and preppy sweaters and you know, that kind of thing. Make a lot of new friends every year, um, you know, taught me about empathy. Uh, have to make, having to make friends fast, have to be really humorous. Uh, it also taught me the power of reinvention. I get to reinvent myself uh, every year. It was actually very freeing because I knew I wouldn't see anyone. I would be on the next coast and you know, I was in a different school, so it was kind of nice. Um, so senior year in high school, I'm in Anaheim. I live in Anaheim and I'm going to high school. I, you know, my mom and I, we check in and we do this whole thing on the first day and the school goes, hey, so we're looking at your junior credits and they're all passing up and they're like basically senior. You're like, you've done a lot of this stuff already. And I'm like, my, my mom was like, okay. And I'm like, okay, so what does that mean? Can I leave early? And they're like, no, we own you from like 2.30 till 2.30. So my mom's like, well, what's he gonna do? Like be in four hours of study hall? And they're like, no, you have two options. You can be in the junior ROTC. My mom is like, hell no, that is never happening to my child. Or you can join the North Orange County ROP program, which is the regional occupational program. And so this is, <laughs> this is work-based learning. And I'm like, what's work-based learning? And they're like, oh, you get to work in a real job, like what real people do. And I'm like, and I got paid? They're like, no, you get high school credit. And I was like, wow, it sounds great. And so I'm looking and I'm like, I don't want to be a car mechanic. I'm going to do wood stuff. I'm not going to sell clothes or work in a bookstore or whatever, although I did end up working at a bookstore at some point. Um, but then I scroll down and I'm like, entertainment. And then I see under entertainment, Disneyland. And I'm like, I can work at Disneyland? And they're like, oh yeah, you can work at Disneyland. And I was like, that's what I would do? I could leave school and then go work at Disneyland? They're like, yes, it's a really good program. There's this woman that's dedicated to it, Tracy. She's, she does, it's great. It's gonna be fun, you'll really love it. And so that's it, get on high school, do my two classes, get on my motorcycle, drive, drive to Disneyland, clock in, literally clock in and show up at this office. And they're like, literally, every two weeks you have a new job. And they're like, yeah, it teaches you everything about all kinds of stuff. And that's working backstage and on stage. 
And you know, so like, for me, it's like, now I'm backstage, working backstage at Disneyland. It's like, amazing. So what, this slide always happens. So what did I do? People always ask. It's like, well, what didn't I do? I was in entertainment. I put on costumes. I was even Chip on the parade and had to do all the Chip and Dale dance shit and like worked in a wardrobe department, worked backstage. I worked in the tiki room and I'd have to wake up Jose and then Jose, you know, the show would start. I was even a Jungle Cruise skipper. Um, this is one of the most visible and engaging positions to be in. You basically have to be a stand-up comedian. Uh, very critical to the show. The job everybody wants. If you're an extrovert, which at the time I was not, so I was really nervous and I really sucked at it. It was like, and I didn't want to, I was like, after two weeks, I'm like, I'm out. I'm out, like, okay. So what I learned from working at Disneyland, or just even being there, just even in high school, as a, as a freebie intern, whatever, was this, you know, we would talk to all the people, and people are really into the show, this idea of the show. And it's about this concept of everything speaks, and you know, every piece of scenery, every element of the environment, from the architecture, landscaping, the wayfinding, and the signage, everything contributes to the place. From the, from the arrival sequence, crossing through a portal, you feel transported. Um, moment, the moment guests see an attraction for the first time, they're immersed in this story. The worlds come to life, and guests are transported to new worlds, maybe lush rainforests, where they may see a pool of bathing elephants. They may even see the backside of water. They may even be, you know, go to another planet, uh, go to Mount Everest, and you are a part of that experience as a cast member. Uh, even if you're in retail or food service, the theme is insanely immersive, and the guests are wowed by all these details. I mean, it's really an incredible feat to do these kind of themed environments. You know, so as an RP student, I got to try a lot of these different onstage and backstage jobs. One day, my counselor, Tracy, says to me, hey, I have a special assignment for you. I think you might really like it. And I said, okay, I'll, I trust you. So, Rennie Bardo was, uh, or is, the official, or was the official photographer at Disneyland since 1959. So he shot hundreds of thousands of photos until his retirement in 1998. Um, he shot the most one of the most famous Walt Disney shots called Footsteps, and it was a spontaneous, it was a grab pick, as he says, it's a grab, the grab shot. So it's a spontaneous thing, he saw Walt coming through from Fantasyland, it, but one morning before the park opened, he grabbed it. It's now on every t-shirt, blah, 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 at Disney. Um, he also shot the last photo of Walt Disney. Uh, my first day with him, he literally said to me, I won't have time to teach you formally, so you're just gonna have to keep up, and you'll figure it out. But he taught me everything. I never picked up a camera in my life. I didn't know what a dark room was, and he taught me all of that. He taught me old school analog, uh, dodging and burning, uh, you know, retouch, old school painting, actual painting. Um, and he taught me everything about like lenses and all that stuff. So what I learned from Rennie is like shoot first and anticipate where, where and when someone might have genuine reactions. Understand people in place, have a relationship and how best to capture that with photography. Um, I asked to extend this excitement and they let me extend for a couple of weeks more and more and then pretty soon I had to get ejected because other people were like, I wanna work for Rennie and so I ended up, Rennie ended up offering me side jobs to photo assist at night and on the weekends, um, basically under the table. And it was great, it was, to this day, this knowledge is what I, just all the time, it's just a core skill now in my brain that I think about all the time. When he retired, he was honored as a Disney legend and was presented with a window. And the window says, Kingdom Photo Services, the magic eye to the world, Rennie Bardot, and it hangs in Main Street uh, over the camera store. Um, in the middle of all this, during my senior year, I also got a job actually at Disneyland. And I picked the, most, the one that pays the most, and that was foods. So uh, I was like, great, I'll work at a restaurant. And so I worked at a restaurant for uh, three and a half years, and then they ended up transferring to the safety department because a former ROP person manager became a manager at the safety department and hired me from, pulled me out of uh, foods and turned me into a safety, working in the safety department. Um, it was great, you know, uh, working at Disneyland, you know, all the Disney, there's all these Disney, uh, there's a Disney softball league, so you join softball because everyone does it, and it's land versus land or attraction versus attraction. It's very funny, it's very organized, and it's taken very seriously in the summer. Uh, too much, in my opinion. Um, 
So it, it was this weird thing in high school where I'd clock out of, I'd go in, school looked like this on a, on a Wednesday, the back half of my senior year, drive to, <laughs> drive to a, my internship, clock in, do my weird job that might be the Tiki Room or Jungle Cruise or something, clock back out, literally go to my other time card, pick that one up, clock in, and then work at a restaurant maybe for like three hours, and then close, close the park at like six o'clock, like in the winter or something like that. So it was very surreal because I was working as, a, as like a cook or whatever, and I would walk around and people would be like, how do you know all these people over at uh, New Orleans or like Bear Country or like Fantasy? And I was like, oh yeah, I work with them. And this is the thing that I do before I work here. And it's just very strange. Anyway, it's very surreal. So I got way too much Disney time, Disneyland time in my life. It is, but it is one of the most important kind of like impactful parts of my life in that it, it really let me see how purely joyful people can be in a place, like seeing their faces. It's, it's you know, children and adults. Twists. So adulting is hard. And I, I lived, moved out of my, uh, out of my mom's house and I was probably you know, 19 or so, and I have an apartment, and I have a car, and I had to get an extra job to pay for that really nice car and that kind of okay apartment. And so I had to get like three jobs, really. So I had Disneyland and two other jobs. I worked at a bookstore, and I worked at another restaurant. And at some point, I was like, I hit a crisis, and I was just like, I, I, that's it. I quit all three. And my friends are like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm quitting all of these jobs, and I'm not working again until I know what I want to do for the rest of my life, and, which is what young, dumb people do. They just think, I think I, that's it. I'm just picking that, and I'm, that's it. And I didn't care if I got evicted. I didn't care whatever. But that is exactly what happened. So I ran out of money. I did get evicted. I lived in my car, and then my car got repossessed. Does anybody know what this is? OK. You know how they work? They, they're very simple. Does anybody know what those are? On the right? OK. So when the money was running out, and I was clearly, uh, basically, my friends were about to kill me because I was couch surfing too much, um, I just planned ahead and said, OK, I got to get, get a pager. So I bought an annual plan on a pager. I got an annual plan on a storage facility. And basically, I lived in a storage facility. And I would do things with the pager. I would, my friends who worked at Disneyland also worked at motels and hotels. That's usually what you do because there's so many hotels and motels in Anaheim. So I had to set up a system of codes that people could text me, uh, page, sorry, page me um, with codes. And I would know that that code was for this motel and come over and you can sleep here. But you got to leave before housekeeping gets here. And so I would like take a bike, take my bike and bike over there. And then I would sleep there for a few hours and take a shower or whatever and then get back out. Or people would text me or page me uh, that the, um, the student hall was open or the, the gym was open, and that I could you know, do refresh and do all that stuff there. Um, I don't want to romanticize this. It was physically and mentally brutal. But in California, if you're going to be homeless, it's not bad to be homeless in Southern California, to be honest. Um, sometimes I'd have to call them and say, like, what's going on? Da, da, da. This is what a payphone looks like, if you don't know what a payphone looks like. They look like this. So, what do homeless people do? I didn't know you could have jobs as a homeless, pe as a homeless person. One of the jobs back then, when pre-internet, was you could wait in line for concert tickets at Tower Records or other places and sleep in front of the box office and wait till the thing opens and you could buy tickets. So there was a whole network of people, of scalpers, hiring homeless people to basically sleep in line from 9 p.m. or midnight till 9 a.m. And basically what you do is you, you sleep in or you hang out, whatever. Then is when it's time to get in line, when you're the next person up, they hand you like 800 bucks and go buy eight Madonna tickets. And then you punch eight Madonna tickets, you turn around, give them the eight Madonna tickets, they give you 50 bucks. And this was great because there was a lot of concerts and there's a lot of shows and it's games, it's everything else. So I did this for a long time until I was like, I don't want to just do that. I actually want to ticket scalp. So I learned from all these people like how to ticket scalp. And it was great because you do this thing, you walk on the walk, what they call the walk. And the walk is the first legal area next to a venue that you can legally scalp tickets. And so everyone's there. And sometimes that's a parking lot in, in Anaheim or Dodgers, or you're at the Bowl, or you're at the Irvine Meadows, or you know, and I would be everywhere. I'd jump in a car with somebody, we'd go and we'd start with no money and literally just hang out and like uh, get game get game tickets for free. And, 
and be like, oh, you have free tickets, whatever, I, you know, I just want to go. And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. And then you just get a bunch of scattered singles. And then you do some bullshit like you put two scattered singles together and say they're a pair. And you're like, hey, I got a pair for it. Oh, great, here's some money. And you're like, ah, sucker, see you later. And you take off. And you go to the other, the other thing. And I, you know, it was great. So, you know, start with zero, make hundreds, thousands of dollars, and then even get the best seats in the house. So as a homeless person, you're like, this is kind of rad, but I'm still sleeping in storage. So I don't know how great it is. It's, you know, the one lesson it did teach me was about manufactured scarcity and that people will pay for experiences. So one of my friends, he says, you got to get a real job, man. You, you just got to get the fuck out and do some something. He's an editor. He's like, I can get you a job at, as a tape operator um, in a video facility that, uh, that I sometimes freelance at. And I was like, OK, they're looking. And I said, I don't know what tape operation is. All right, you got to tell me. He's like, yeah, I'll teach you. And so he would do that. He would like help let me hang out first and understand what the thing is, and then I went into interview. And so this is what a tape room used to look like. Very analog, but also very, quote, digital. And on the right, that's an editing bay. And they used to have this very hierarchy, very like, the laborer is down there, and we are two steps up. We are the production company, the agency, and then the client is at the very top. So it's very Game of Thrones or something. Very, it's all about hierarchy. So you know, video machines, et cetera. And it was a night job. I interviewed. I got it. It was a graveyard shift. My job was to basically be a tape assist or an editor assist. And I, self, I noticed there was a CGI room, which had one softy, no, one alias box. Alias, you know, back then was just had this one 3D platform, uh, program. I taught myself camera. I taught myself editing, uh, nonlinear editing even, which was brand new back then. Um, and I taught myself a little bit of animation, but mostly editing. And it was great, because eventually, I would end up becoming an editor and editing on the side and freelancing and stuff. And it was really great. And uh, even, even so much so that I got promoted because when I left one of my work tapes in one night and I thought I was in trouble the next day when they found it. And they said, no, we'll promote you. And it was great. It was awesome. And so now I'm making this decent money. I have a room. I'm having you know, roommates and stuff. And one of my friends that's working here says, hey, I'm taking this class at UCLA. It's for digital visual effects at a VFX facility in Santa Monica called Digital Magic. It was 10 courses, 30 hours. You pay X dollars. And I was like, are they using what we're using? He's like, they're using exactly what we're using. But they're working on TV shows and visual effects. And I was like, that's cool. So I was like, that's awesome. So you look, I go to this visual effects facility. It looks exactly like our facility. And even those guys are just like just nerds like us. But they're like doing Emmy, they're winning Emmys and stuff. And this is great. So I said, you know. I'll go, let's go, we go. We start to get familiar with the teachers, these guys, and they're like, you should work here because you already know this shit. You're just not doing TV. You're just doing these other commercials or like, you know, like uh, you know, direct marketing ads and stuff. And I was like, okay, thanks. And so I remembered that and it was great. Another friend, all this is happening. I'm still an editor. I'm still taking this class. I'm almost done. My friend says, hey, who works at Paramount, she's, she's a page. She says, hey, I have a friend who's working on a TV show. They need someone. They need an intern in the post-production department of this TV show. And I said, OK. She goes, it's like what you want to do, right? You want to do visual effects? I said, yeah, I, I do, but I don't know it. She's like, you don't have to know it. You're going to be an intern. Anyways, you're going to be a PA. And so I interview with them. And the associate producer's like, OK, so basically it's this. And you know, you'll be helping out on this show. And you can do it. You know, It's everything. It's running paper around. It's getting someone a coffee. It's, like, it's all the things you know as a PA. And uh, also, you're going to have to drive around a lot because we work everywhere, all over LA. So you got to have a good car, and you got, you know, and we'll pay your mileage, et cetera. And I was like, OK. And I said, well, I'm, I'm familiar with some of the stuff you guys do. He's like, how are you familiar with all this? And I said, well, I'm an editor, and I use all this equipment anyways. I just don't do this. I just do this with other equipment. He's like, you're an editor? And I was like, yeah, I, I, I edit, and I'm a tape operator. And he's like, oh, so why do you want to be an intern? It's unpaid. And I was like, well, because I think this is what I want to do. And he's like, it's a full-time internship. It's five days a week for six months. And it's probably not going to be 40 hours. It'll probably be like 60 hours. And I was like, I still want to do it. I'll drive 32 miles each way to go. And they said, they said, if you can make it work, that's fine. So I talked to my boss. And he says, this sounds like a great opportunity. Let's figure it out. You work double shifts on the weekend. Get four hours of sleep. You'll figure, you're young. You'll figure it out. You don't need that much sleep anyways. And they support me. And this is incredible, because that usually doesn't happen. And so I go backwards to go forwards, right? And so the TV show is Star Trek The Next Generation. But of course, uh, 
they always want to do, add more work, so I'm also working on Star Trek D Space Nine. And so uh, this is it, core memories ahead, Captain. It was suggested in the first week when I worked there that I should buy a camera because actually we need cameras all the time. Film cameras, kids, not digital. Um, and I took a lot of photos for work, for models and things like that, but also because I just kept getting all kinds of film. I just take pictures of everything. And I mean everything. And it was wild because nobody gave a shit back then. They were just like, yeah, so that's fine. Can I take a picture? Yeah. But like, there's no social, there's no internet. Nobody even thinks about this. So I, you know, PAs, they ride bikes. We used to deliver blueprints, anything, call sheets, scripts, drawings, et cetera. All physical paper, no PDFs, you lazy Gen Z brats. And so, yeah, we would have to walk, run, bike, drive all over fucking Hollywood all hours of the night to deliver two pages to a director in Glendale or something. And, you know, I was going to add snow and stuff like that, but like it doesn't snow in LA, so I was like, you know. Anyways, they paid for the mileage, and that was fun, and it was great to get out of the office, because actually, truly, we were the only ones that get to leave the set and the, uh, the stage and the office. Um, so, yeah, again, the best film school I never had to pay for that I actually got paid poorly to, to, to be in. This is just Klingon on a break. Casting, this is what a cattle call looks like, if you've ever been an actor. Just hundreds of you know, people like, oh, I want to be a background. On, I want to get killed in a red shirt. Um, yeah, this is stage 16, also known as Planet Hell. If you've ever seen a cave or a planet where they beam down since the original series and Next Gen and DS9, Voyager, that's it. And that's little Alba there. It was sometimes you'd be waiting for shots, you know, and, or waiting for someone to do something and they were in between takes, so you I randomly walk around and I'm sitting there, boom, boom, boom. You know, taking pictures wherever I can. Working with lots of models. And these are the original three. D Space Nine. Sometimes we blow up ships or have to do things with other parts of ships, like wear it on your head. You got to learn about cloud tank and other kinds of special effects photography. That's actually Rob Legato on the camera. He's a very famous visual effects supervisor. Um, yeah, it was a really good team, man. Good team. Beautiful imagery being done in camera. No CGI at this time. CGI shots used to cost like $200,000 for six seconds. It's insane. More models. RIP, Gary Hutzel on the left, an amazing visual effects supervisor. He used to basically did all the Battlestar Galactica stuff for Ron Moore. We used to use big, brutal machines here in Hollywood on Highland. That's a place called Image G. It's a DOS-operated, uh, repeatable moving camera on a rig. Sometimes we have to edit ourselves. I would have to edit clips. They're like, how oh, do you know how to edit, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, can you and Wendy figure out we, you know, so, I don't know, some, some Planet Hollywood needs clips. Or like, you get random licensing questions all the time, li licensing requests for all kinds of things or a card or something like toys. Toys, you get tons of toys, requests, book requests, lot, lots of nonsense. And then so you just do it, it was great. Nice, some nice behind the scenes, some trivia. If there was a lunch and they weren't using the shuttle bay or the, uh, and they weren't using it as a holodeck, they would make it as the lunchroom. That's baby Alba there. That is a black and white laptop. And that's a phone right next to it if you don't know what a phone is. <laughs> Join the softball, they trusted me enough to put me on the softball team, whooping other TV shows' asses. In the summertime, I was like, need, feel, it was slow. In the summertime, a lot of people were shooting the feature. I was slightly working on the feature called Generations. And yeah, I said, I need, I need, a, I need a project that's like, what, what's, what could I do? I was getting frustrated because I didn't know the show. So they're like, you got to watch the show because you got to know all the shit. You got to know what a Klingon yada yada looks like. And I was like, okay. And so I was like, well, how do you do it? How do you keep track? He's like, well, we have this piece of paper that's like, I was like, can we make a database? Because even back then, I knew what a database was. I was like, I have Excel, I can make a database. Excel is not a database, by the way. But can I just, what I want to do is, I want to be able to identify, I want some naming convention, and I want to put Polaroids on the outsides of these massive crates so I don't have to open them up and discover that it's the wrong model. And they're like, if you do it, we'll get a, get a, get a transpo guy, We'll drive you around and we'll go to where all the models are parked. And most of them are parked in Van Nuys back then, but some of them were all over the, the different houses for shooting. So I had to go to work and I started just grabbing, opening up every model, taking pictures, 
really detailed pictures and Polaroids, making a database in Excel, and I got to basically hand touch almost every model that's ever existed uh, in, the, in the entire Trek universe. Even the movie model that we sent to ILM, you know, you know, that got logged in. Other props, you know, like there's a miniature mountain range for a movie for show. And it was great, and I had a really fun time doing it. Um, some things I learned uh, from this sort of family slash crew is that behind every big problem are a bunch of smaller problems waiting to be solved. Think in pieces. It's a jigsaw puzzle. Solve for each piece and you'll complete the picture. Embrace happy accidents. Think simply and focus on what matters. There's always another way to do something. High fidelity where needed, low fidelity elsewhere. So the Enterprise D bridge, their show's over, gets destroyed in the feature film. Its remains are not even cold yet, and they build the Voyager bridge right on top of it. Um, through a series of events from a friend, I got offered a really interesting opportunity, and so all things must come to an end, and after two seasons, I move on. But again, the best film school I ever attended. I worked on over 100 episodes of television for that series. Next Gen, DS9, Voyager, and then Generations, uh, affectionately known as Two Captains, One Hairpiece. So another thing about being supported when you're kind of like a PA or an intern is that people know you don't know anything. They just know you don't know anything. So they're just like, okay. But, and I always tell students, it's okay to say I don't know. But you gotta say, but I'll find out, because that's really, that's really the job. The job is, yeah, we know you don't know. So go find out, right? I also, when I was pulling photos, I just noticed that everybody's on fucking phones here. Phones, phones, phones. I love phones. I still make phone calls all the time. So that's Trek. So here we are. And now another friend says, hey, I know you're a PA on Star Trek. Do you want to be a visual effects supervisor on another TV show in Vancouver? And I said, is that how it works? You just go and become a... They're like, well, we know you know it, so just do it. Like, just be on set and do the thing and shoot it and do all the stuff. And so I kind of said, okay, I'll do it. And I kind of left. And well, Trek was cool because they was like, you're going to go take that show? They don't even know if they're going to get picked up after season one. And I was like, I know, but it's kind of cool, isn't it? They're like, eh, maybe. And let's talk. They talked to the show. They're like, okay, yeah. And then they even said, like, hey, if it doesn't go well, like, come back. You're like, we'll hire you. We'll figure out a place. And I was like, that's great. So I become a visual effects supervisor. I move and I become this VFX supervisor. And I'm learning on the fly. I'm like trying to figure stuff out. I don't have this whole deep network of like eight mentors who have won Amy's and Oscars to like teach me stuff. And so also my soft skills in producing are also horrible. I didn't know all the drama that goes on in budgeting and politics of departments trying to steal your money, et cetera. I had zero understanding of that, but I learned really quickly. And so yeah, you know, tearing muscle, just trying to figure shit out. There's no softball, so I'd join a curling team. You know, just trying to experiment. At first, you're just imitating, and then you have to insert your own kind of theories on it. That did not work out, by the way. That's a that shot is bad. You get to work with interesting talent, and sometimes the talent also needs other talent, like a puppet. Um, I got to work on really interesting camera rigs, sometimes in some really weird situations, some very unsafe situations, and I just want to continue to try and do in-camera visual effects and try and not rely on CGI so much. So just practicing, you know, keep, keep practicing my craft so I can keep moving and get, getting better at something. This art piece is called Paradox of Praxis. It's something, uh, sometimes making something leads to nothing in Mexico City, 1997. Praxis means, it's Greek, it's verb, it's exercise or practice of an art, science, idea, or skill. Um, what Francis did was, he pushed a block of ice in July 1997 in Mexico City. And he basically, it's a video piece, but it's an active live piece that he does. So at first he's pushing and pushing and pushing this heavy block of ice. And then pretty soon he's just kind of kicking it. And then pretty soon it's so tiny that it just, it's really easy and it goes far and then it just, at some point it just melts. And that's really practice. The practice doesn't inevitably lead to something. That's why there's making and then there's doing. And practice is doing to me, anyway. Um, so I've been doing this for a while. 
and I'm noticing something consistent that I'm building a lot of blue screens and a lot of green screens. And it's just, that's like my job now, is just being um, a green screen guy. And I'm really over it. So I start to like pivot and do other things that are like not supervising green screens all the time. So I end up doing a lot of things and consulting and building facilities for studios to build, to basically do VFX for, for movies. And so I become this kind of like person who can facilitate, create from scratch uh, facilities, like in Austin, Texas, I had to do one for a movie, and then all over Asia, I stood up a bunch of um, studios in uh, the Philippines, uh, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, and uh, uh, consulted and did some stuff in Seoul and Bangkok as well for years. And I also started to look for science documentaries because I was kind of sick of arbitrary creative decisions. I also was, you know, out of frustration because I kept having to do it, I just templatized everything I would use, these tools I would use, like tracking markers and lens grids. And so I thought, there's gotta be other people that need this, that have this problem too. So I just published them all. And these trackers are everywhere. These markers are everywhere, not, not so much now. But these lens grids are also everywhere. Um, they've been downloaded over 10,000 times, I saw in Dropbox not too long ago. Um, yeah, and I just, it's just me sharing, again, knowledge. And I also took a really detailed, uh, at the time, uh, sort of photo dump of my visual effects kit for, for starting supervisors. Um, oh, I'm behind, sorry. Uh, so yeah, keep, keep on doing that. Switching to science documentaries, still itching for something new. I'm noticing that there's this thing called motion design and that they are using our tools in visual effects for something that is not photorealistic or like live action. And I'm like, what the hell is that? What is this? Why, why are they doing that? Why are they taking these tools from me? And so I was like, you know, I thought it was interesting because usually my whole job is just to like make it look real, that it's integrated. And instead it's like, how do you start with a white frame and look dev for this? And what the hell is a style frame? And who the fuck is doing this? And chances are, and most of the time it's in New York. And so I moved to New York. I'm like, I'm moving. So I go and move to New York. I find out I'm only one of three real visual effects supervisors in New York. So I start to trade my services to learn about design jobs as a producer because I wanted to know like how, how to do this, like the process of it. So I get paired up with really, really great creative directors and designers and I work at places like PSYOP and Buck and Brandon School and Digital Kitchen and Trollback as a producer that, whose value add is I really know camera and visual effects. And again, keep practicing and now I'm learning about design work and then even in design work, I'm noticing a different trend and that's like all these things are not, these outputs are not now for linear, rectilinear media, they're for kiosks and projection mapping and different canvases and now who the fuck is doing this now? So I find out and I start researching them and stalking them and asking them to hire me and they're like, we don't need you, you don't know anything about this stuff. And so I keep doing it and I'm like, okay, now I know what this is at least I, in research. And I found out this place called Hush, and I stalked them. I said, do you, I wanna hire, I'm gonna be hired by you, and they're like, we don't, we don't do that, until one day they needed a visual effects supervisor. And they said, hey, can you do this one, it's a one day shoot, it's really low budget. And I said, no, what's the budget? That, yeah, that's low budget, I'll do it. And they, I get there on the day, we have to shoot in Baltimore, I do it, and not only do I do the visual effects supervision, I said, well, you know, I can also first AD this, I'll also produce the shoot, and I'll also post-produce the spot all for the same rate, which they love to hear. And so once I did that, the HO, the head of production is like, you know, you have a knack for stuff. Like we have this project, it's really crazy, it's a 10 day event, it's got all this like technology and stuff and like we think you could produce it. And I said, I don't you know 90% of this shit. But what the owner said, they said, we know but we know you're gonna figure it out. So they had real trust for me. What I loved about this, it put me into a totally different world of design thinking research, prototyping, and then you know full-scale testing. It was just really fantastic from, there was more considered thinking and work being done. This is very scrappy, Hush is a very scrappy shop back then. Um, right next to the trains, every five minutes we'd get disrupted by the Q train. And it's a you know work hard, play hard, very family friendly. What I loved about it was the strategy and design thinking, always asking why, 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 understanding the goal and the intention of these experiences design an appropriate strategy, and map a tactic back to it to hit those intentions and that strategy. I love that we can prototype and test things and see them all the way through fruition. Sometimes they die, sometimes they don't. And again, very scrappy, just kind of like, does it work? We might, it 
it might work, we don't know. Sometimes you have to rent a asbestos ridden fucking warehouse and rent, you know, two tiles of a thing just to kind of test for two days what the capabilities are of this tech at the time. And again, this idea of like mixing low and fide low fidelity and high fidelity, you don't need high fidelity at scale. You just need scale and you slice high fidelity. And this, these concepts are great to me. It's exactly how I think. So I'm like, yeah, mixed fidelities, this totally makes sense. Again, only where needed. And then there's this thing called value engineering, which is a horrible term and nobody likes it, but it's real. And it's this idea of like, sometimes you have to kill things, but you don't have to kill all of it. And so you see there it's a strike and strike, so we have to kill LEDs, but that was okay, because all we did was just add reflective surfaces. When it comes to LEDs in the dark, reflective surfaces are your friend most of the time. And so you can see that here. You can see that, uh, oh, look at that. Oh, there it is, right there. Well, now I'm backwards. But you can see the reflection on the right between and on the left. And no one ever said anything. Nobody ever said, hey, um, that screen's not big enough. Again, this is just projection, low fidelity, high fidelity. Clients don't care, they get it. They're like, yeah, we get the process. You're managing our expectations. We know it doesn't look like this, but we're only supposed to look at this. And sometimes, you know what sneaker net is? Sneaker net is basically, the Wi-Fi doesn't work at the track and field, so someone's gotta run around with a USB stick. So that's Alba. That's what Alba gets to do. Welcome to producing. And sometimes it's just about pixels, so it's not about the material, so the material could be anything. And maybe the screens aren't determined yet, so you use projection. And sometimes it's about the combination of the materials and the pixels, so you gotta test with real samples. And sometimes you gotta bash things together and invent new things, like 360 rigs made out of seven GoPros. And then you gotta figure out how to get a bunch of iPads that talk to GoPros together to make it look like one preview monitor. And then also, how do you charge these goddamn ba cameras that we're gonna have to shoot with? Because one row of those cameras is the actual footage, and one row of those cameras is just a preview monitor. And it kind of worked, sort of. Tiny GoPro rig on a, steady, on, a, on a Segway. This is a paper prototype with one Pico projector. That's an iPhone 4 for scale. And now it worked, we, th now we think it's gonna work. We think it's gonna work. So we have a user foam core model now. This is high, more accurate for say, there's a cut out there. That's so that our CEO can put his head in it and look at it at eye level because this is poor man's VR, guys. So now we're out on site, we're building. There's baby Elbers right there. Checking it out, helping us map some stuff. And again, prototype, reality. Mini, model, prototype, prototype. Can't afford LEDs inside each of these slots, too expensive, too much labor to build it, just project on it. It's the same thing. Prototype, this is Telart for the Museum of the Future. Prototype, take the blueprints, print it down in scale. Laser CNC, some shapes. And then again, just to figure out if it's gonna work, right? Prototype, you just need to know what the joysticks do. We use the cardboard boxes from the light stands for the monitors. And then again, it works. Sphere, also prototypes. They have a 25% scale test dome in Burbank that's a one for one in the interior dome. That's a one for one pixel duplicate. It's just a smaller pitch. And currently, this is the largest in, uh, spherical LED dome screen right now until Sphere in Vegas opens very soon. It's big. This is just the 25%. So that's it. I'm grateful for these experiences. Um, a lot of things didn't work out, but a lot of things did work out. Uh, again, it's like, uh, my thing is, all these experiences, all my friends showed me all these things, and, you know, and so I think these three takeaways are very simple. Constant learning is your friend. Be fearless. You don't have to be an expert. And it is absolutely okay to change lanes. So for me, what's the future? What am I trying to do? I want to do colorful, playful projects with very contemplative moments. They should change your perception of what space can be. They should feel larger than life, magical, using technology that is invisible. And they should be alive, they should be human-centered, they should connect humans and inspire humans. And I'll also continue to mentor and support my peers, and I'm researching to create programs that give access to these kind of technologies 
to those who might not otherwise afford it, like artist residency programs and student development programs. So that's, that's my journey. As, as, as much as I went over, this is it. And so, you know, I don't know what the future is. Where am I headed? What's that going to be? Something familiar, easy. That's not horrible. But according to history, uh, I'm probably going to go for the unknown and the uncomfortable. So one more thing. Do you remember the person that gave you your first break? Um, this is a good time to take out your phones. Um, do you remember what that felt like when you first got that first job? So here's a request. I, I want you to scan this QR code. This QR code is going to take you to a list of students and recent graduates with the skills needed to work in this industry, in our profession. I made a black and white version, a little high con as well. Hopefully you get it. These people may not have been able to attend this event physically, may have graduated into a pandemic. They may be struggling to grow or connect with a network, to know publications and portals. They may just need a job. I'm not asking you to give them a job. What I'm asking you to do is give them 30 minutes of your time, answer questions, connect them to somebody else, connect them to a resource, point them towards an organization. These are folks who may not have been able to build their network and grow as a professional post-pandemic. So let's correct this and start doing, connecting and building our community and workbench for the future. And if you know a student that's not on this list or a recent grad, let Laura know, let Framework know. Thank you. I don't know if we have uh, time for Q&A. Um, I think we can sneak a couple of questions in. If anybody has any, uh, Eric is around. You can find him at happy hour, too. Um, thanks, man. That was awesome. There's a happy hour? There's a happy hour. Oh, God. Thank you. <laughs> There's two happy hours I hope, here. I, I hope. I'm so sorry I went over time. No, please. It, we can get one or two questions in. Otherwise, I'll give us a break, and we'll come back in about 15 and hear from a couple of sponsors. We're we good? Thank you, Eric. Okay, thanks guys. I was trying not to talk.